This Week in East Brunswick. We'll have the fourth and concluding segment in the library's Parent Infant Program series. Sharon Carmazan continues her in-studio interviews, this week featuring the Animal Rescue League. And Chris Shirley will preview her new spot on local restaurants, which will premiere on Channel 8, April 7th. Later, Adrian Eisner from the Township's Consumer Affairs Department will discuss health spas. And we'll see some of the action from this week's Township Council meeting. But first, Channel 8 takes a quick look at another camera crew on location at the library. Eyewitness News reporter Mara Walensky was at the library this week to do a feature on the Kurzweil Reading Machine and its instructor, Lauren Casey. The machine, an optical scanning device that reads printed material to the visually impaired, is based at the library and is funded by the East Brunswick Lions Club. Ms. Walensky and her crew interviewed Ms. Casey, one of her students, and library assistant director Sharon Cormazan, and taped the Kurzweil machine in action. The over two hours of taping will be eventually edited into a two-minute spot for Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Also here at the library, the Children's Department's Parent Infant Program concluded this week with a lecture by nutritionist Carol Savage. A wide range of topics were discussed, including whole milk versus formula feeding, sugar intake, and baby food labeling. Something you want to look for on the label is when they list the ingredients. Ingredients are listed in the concentration that they're present. So for example, on this product, what is the number one ingredient? Water. And the next? Uh-huh. And then there's corn syrup. What is corn syrup? Sugar. And this is something you're going to want to look for. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad product, but you might decide that you're not interested in having that added to the the fruit in this case that you're purchasing. What could you do then if you decided that you didn't want to have this? You could, look, you could look for another brand, of course, or make your own. Make your own. I imagine that's possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does anyone here make their, own, uh, make their own baby food? How would you make apricots for your baby? Peel them, and then I, I assume uh, either put them in a blender or a food processor. You can just mash them up. You don't even need to have a food processor or a blender. Yeah. You can take just a little strainer, maybe buy a jar uh, or a can of the apricots. What you want to look for, though, is that your canned fruits come in different kinds of syrup. And you might want to get it packed in water or in a light syrup, but not in a heavy syrup, because that's going to be adding more sugar. And then you just can mash up a little bit of the apricots and offer that. I know some people use a lot of homemade baby food because they use the foods that they're normally eating. And you always have a little bit of leftovers. And you can set the food aside before you add your salt and your other kinds of seasoning, your butter. And that might be a good idea. Now, what some people do is to take their leftovers and mash up some vegetables or whatever that you have left and put it in an ice cube tray. And then you can freeze it. I'll show you some. These are different things that you can use, the blender or a food mill. Some people will invest a couple of dollars in getting a food mill to mash up their food. I'm sure many of us mash up bananas. We don't buy bananas in the jar. That's something you can carry with you. And uh, mash up uh, leftovers, let's say, you know, vegetables that have been mm -hmm. sitting out through dinner and maybe a little while longer until you cleaned up. Would that still have an adequate nutritional content? Once they've been cooked, there really shouldn't be a problem of losing the nutritional content while they're sitting out. But it probably would be a good idea to set aside some of the food before you serve it. Because many times when we cook for our families, we add things to our vegetables. And one thing that you might add would be butter or salt or things along those lines. And babies really don't need to have that added. Sometimes we have to think about what our tastes are and how many times we add things to baby food because we think the baby will accept it more. There's a lot of thought to the fact that infants might be learning in an early stage in their life to have things that are sweet or salty and they develop that taste and as they get older they become adults who want sweet things or salty items and that may lead to some health problems down the road. If you steam the vegetables, would mm -hmm. it be to the baby's advantage to then use some of the water to Very mash good it idea, with? Yes, because when you steam, what happens to the nutrients? They go into the 
they go into the water. And steaming is probably the best way to prepare a vegetable, for example, because you have the least loss of nutrients. And that would be an excellent idea to hold back some of that water, mash it up, put it in the ice cube tray, and freeze it in your freezer. Then when you're ready to serve it, which should be within the next couple of days, you just pop out the cube, let it come to room temperature, and there you have some vegetable or fruit to offer to your child. Now some people feel that there's a little bit of time involved in this. That'll be a decision that you need to make. We all do prepare food in our house. And all you would need to do then would be to set aside a small amount. Now I would suggest that after the, the food has been frozen, that you pop the cube out and put it into a plastic container if you're not going to use it within the next day or so. And you can just put different food items in different slots in your tray. I think we have an example of that here. You'll want a label, though, because sometimes you're not going to remember that on Monday you had green beans and Thursday you had sweet potatoes, and the next week you may not recall which one you need to use first. So it would be a good idea to put a label on and put a name. Sometimes when you mash up a food, you might not be able to tell the green peas from the green beans. <laughs> so it would be helpful if you're looking for one item over the other. What about formula? Are you all still using formula for your children? Anyone here using whole milk or any other kind of a milk? One thing that's very important that you'll want to be careful about is not using the 2% or low-fat milk unless you've been advised to do so by your doctor. It's very common now with a lot of people interested in cutting out fat in their diet that when you take your child off of formula, you may decide to use the same milk that you're purchasing for your family. The problem with that is that for the first two years of life, your infant needs to have some fat. And if you use the 2% milk, you get very little fat. Your baby will still grow, but your baby will not be getting the fat that it needs. And that's very important in their development in later years. But after two years, the fat is not as important. And perhaps then you might want to think about using the 2% milk. For any information about this or any other children's activities at the library, call Children's Services 390-6769. Hello, this is Sharon Karmazin here at the library with, for this week in East Brunswick. And with me this week, I have the two directors of the Animal Rescue Force of East Brunswick. I'd like you to meet Colleen Paolo, all the way over on my right, and Isabel Shaw. Welcome, ladies. And who's that with you today? This is Samantha. My Samantha, dog. welcome, Samantha. Now, I know you told me right before we started a little story about Samantha, and I'm going to ask you about that in a little while. But first, maybe, Isabel, you can tell us, what is the Animal Rescue Force? The Animal Rescue Force is an organization that finds homes for homeless pets in New Jersey. We try to find people who can no longer keep their pets and people who are looking for pets and match them up at our adoption center in the Route 1 flea market. Now, what type of pets do you handle? Uh, dogs and cats. Dogs and cats. All ages, uh -huh. all breeds, all types. I see. And you mentioned the Route 1 flea market is your base of operation. If a person were interested in having, in putting a pet up for adoption, let's say they were leaving the area and they couldn't keep their pet with them, what would they do? They would contact our office uh, during from 11 a.m. till 6 p.m., make a reservation with us, we'll reserve a cage in their name, and they will bring the pet up on the Saturday or Sunday that they made the reservation with a $20 deposit. 16 of that deposit is refunded at the end of the day and if the animal wasn't adopted they have to take the animal back with them and try again the next day. I see. Generally what is, what is the percentage of success with something like this? It's, uh, it's really hard to say. We have a, um, a very good adoption rate and, but we strive more for quality homes rather than quantity. Um, we really seek out, we have a staff of trained volunteers we work very hard to find the perfect home for each dog. So we really have uh, quality homes, I feel. Okay. What about if someone in our viewing audience is interested in adopting a dog? How do they let you know that they'd like to provide a quality home? Well, they will go to our adoption center on Saturday at 11 to 5 or Sunday from 11 to 5. And they will speak with either the manager of the day or one of our group of volunteers and uh, be interviewed and screened and sign a contract agreeing to take care of the animal, have it spayed and neutered, take it to a vet, 
um, generally care for the animal for the, uh, its entire life, and we ask for a minimum $10 donation. I see. Well, <laughs> that gets us to Samantha. <laughs> the story of Tell Samantha. Tell us your story of Samantha, because I know she's one of your, one of your personal success <laughs> yes. stories. Uh, Samantha was brought to our adoption center two and a half years ago in October. She was a stray on the street. And a couple that could not keep her brought her to us. And that same day, she was adopted out to another couple. Five months later, uh, one of the couple died, and the wife could no longer keep her. So as with our contract, anyone that adopts from us must agree to call us and notify us if they can no longer keep the dog or the cat. And they called us. We happened to be closed. So as a volunteer, I agreed to harbor Samantha until we could get her another home. End of story. <laughs> She's been with me for two years. Well, it looks like you, <laughs> that, you that ARF made a very good match yes. in that particular case. And One she that's going to last. shares her home with another dog and a cat. I see. That I have. Well, you mentioned now you were a paid Animal res Rescue Force worker, but right. you started out as a volunteer. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about how people might get, in get involved with ARF as volunteers? Very easily. They just c can call us at our office, stop by at the adoption center. We're always looking for caring people um, to help us, you know, find home for the animals, to uh, answer our phones, to do filing for us in our office, uh, and to harbor. We need harbors desperately. Okay, can you maybe just define a little bit what you mean by harbor, since you did mention that people bring their animals only on the day that you're in operation? Okay, a harbor would be used in an emergency type situation where someone uh, that can no longer keep a pet that they've adopted from us uh, due to severe allergies or a death in the family, whatever the case may be, we need someone to board the animal, be a foster parent until we can then put it back up for adoption. Oh, I see, I guess foster parent is, yes. is just is that the right the term. term. That's what I was thinking of all. Yes. So. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to tell us about ARF? Again, can you give us the telephone numbers? where people might reach you for further information. It's 257-7559 from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday and our adoption center is open Saturday and Sunday from 11 till 5 in the Route 1 flea market. Great, okay. Well, I'd like to thank Isabel, Colleen, and Samantha for being <laughs> with us today on This Week in East Brunswick and we'll see you again next time. Thank you. Thank you. The Friends of the Library will be holding their ninth annual book sale at the Brunswick Square Mall, April 19th to April 24th. On sale will be thousands of hardcovers as well as paperbacks for adults and children. A special preview night, 7 p.m. April 18th, will kick off the sale. And there will be a $1 admission charge for this night only. That's the Friends of the Library book sale at the Brunswick Square Mall, April 19th to April 24th, April 18th, special preview night. Hello, I'm Adrian Eisner of the East Brunswick Consumer Affairs Office. Welcome to Consumer Aware. Many Americans are involved in some type of physical fitness program or some attempt to get into physical shape. Are you looking for a way to get into shape? You might be considering joining a health spa a place where members work to improve their physical condition through exercise, weight control, and other treatments. You will get the most enjoyment and minimize the possibility of disappointments if you find out about the spa's fees, contractual requirements, and facilities before you actually join. Here are some suggestions for comparison shopping for a health spa. First of all, be sure to inspect the spa. Visit during the hours you would normally be using it. See if it is overcrowded. Notice whether the facilities are well maintained. Inspect for cleanliness and note the condition of the equipment. Here are some questions you should ask. Is there a trial period during which I can sample services but not be obligated to join? What hours will I be able to use the spa? What qualifications or special training do the instructors have? Consider the contracts carefully. Some spas ask you to join right away. You might be offered special time-limited rates as an incentive. 
But if you wait a few days, you can make a better decision. Take the contract home and read it carefully. Before you sign, see if you can answer these questions. Is everything the salesperson promised you verbally written into the contract? Is there a cooling off period? Some spas give you a number of days to reconsider your decision to join after you have actually signed the contract. Can you get a refund if you need to cancel? If you move, become disabled, or just want to stop using the spa? Can you afford the payments? If you have any questions, be sure to call us before you sign a health spa contract. You can reach us at 390-6954. We're in the office Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. And thank you for joining me on Consumer Aware. Hi, my name is Chris Shirley. Be sure to stay tuned next week to my new restaurant show. It's called Chris Shirley's Restaurant Guide. It will be aired every two weeks during the This Week in East Brunswick news show. I will taking a, be taking a look at the different restaurants in our area and giving you, the viewer, an idea of the restaurants in East Brunswick. So be sure to stay tuned. The Township Council meeting began with the announcement that the 1983 municipal budget would not be passed as originally planned. Finance Director L. Mason Neely explains. Mr. Uh, Neely, you have informed me of some technical changes that need to be made and published. Do you want to explain to the council? <coughs> yes, the, uh, the budget after it's introduced has to be sent to the Division of Local Governmental Services and Training, who has to approve it, which means that they have to look at it to make sure it's within cap and it meets the format that they have prescribed. Looking at the budget amendment, which was the results of the uh, alterations to the budget that the council made, the budget submitted by the mayor, uh, the division said the total is, is no problem, your cap limitation is no problem, but we would like just some technical changes. Uh, and so the amendment that you have before you tonight, which precludes you from adopting the budget, is simply to move some of the numbers around to meet their format. Uh, after you adopt this and advertise it, you then can have an approved budget which can be voted on at your special meeting of uh, April 4th. So it does not change the total or the tax rate or the plan of appropriation. It simply moves a couple of numbers around to meet their desired format. Uh, I have a few comments on the budget also. This has been a very difficult budget process. And the next few years on, on the local level, whether it's school board, fire companies, or uh, in the municipality, are going to be very difficult. The, we've just begun to feel the impact of measures taken on state and, and national level this year. With the cut in revenue sharing from, from, the, from the national level, with the cut in the anticipated girls and franchise receipts on, on the state level, which meant that our revenues went down considerably on those levels. The impact is going to be felt more and more on the local governmental level because there's nowhere else to push it down to, and so that we have to cope. In doing this and taking a look at the budget, we did some things which were painful and will have an impact. The basic result is that within the budget, there are at least eight positions that will not be filled this year that were in the budget, plus $120,000 cut from the uh, salary adjustment account, which the council anticipates could mean as many as 10 other 10 more people being laid off for a total of about 18 reduction in all over the year in the number of people being employed by the township. Now this obviously is going to have an impact on the services that are delivered to the public, but we feel it is necessary because of the crunch that we are receiving as the tax dues come down and the cut in the money comes down to us from the federal and the national, uh, the state level. However, some good things have come out of this budget also. Through the discussions, primarily between the mayor and myself, we have been able to determine that we will set up this year a merit system and uh, for exempt employees, 
which will happen in some element of performance management system. And I think this is a very good thing to be happening in our township. We've also agreed that we will have a consultant, an outside consultant, look at the operations of the uh, recreation parks and public works departments. And this, I think, will have uh, a benefit that will be felt in the long run uh, in future budgets. Both of these things, I think, are positive things that are happening. They are things that make East Brunswick a, a forward-looking town, a town that is concerned about its management and delivery of services. Not a town that's going downhill, but a town that's really proud of itself in the direction that it's going in, but is aware that there are problems on all levels, that the fiscal crunch is hitting us, and it's hitting our residents. And we are doing our best to cope with it. As in recent weeks, the public portion of the meeting again contained comments and criticisms from residents about the revaluation process. And again, residents were told that any and all complaints about the figures involved would be reviewed by Tax Assessor William Bailey before May 1st for any adjustments. 